uh, thanks to Steve for inviting me here. And um, it's, it's tough to follow some of these talks earlier, uh, but I'll do my best. So um, I'm with a magazine called Zoetrope Ulster. We're based in San Francisco. And um, by the mid-1990s, Francis Ford Coppola was fed up with the state of American popular film. He felt that the foundation of good storytelling and affecting emotion had cracked under the weight of explosions and effects. And he felt a responsibility to give back to the medium that had given him so much. And at the same time, he shared Alfred Hitchcock's perspective that um, the art form most akin to film is the short story because the viewer or the reader consumes each in one sitting. So in 1997, he founded um, Zoetrope All Story, a publication of short fiction and one-act plays. And his intention was to invest in the best and kind of greatest, most promising writers of our time in the hope that their stories would serve as grist for more complex and thoughtful films. He based the uh, format of the magazine on the WPA uh, publications from the 1930s that were published and funded by the US government to support writers during the Great Depression, and which debuted work by Ring Lardner, Dorothy Parker, Ralph Ellison, Saul Bellow, John Steinbeck. Um, and like those publications, he chose at least initially to print on newsprint because he felt that the more perishable an item, the more it would be treasured. Um, for the name of the magazine, he took uh, the name of America's original short fiction magazine, which was called All Story, which had published in the mid-19th century, and appended it to the name of his film company, Zoetrope. And as Stephen mentioned, on the, um, the magazine's first anniversary, to sort of manifest this collaborative nature of filmmaking, he introduced the guest designer concept by which every edition would be designed by a different leading artist um, who would determine, I mean, act as art director, so determine the aesthetic direction, um, choose the paper, uh, format, binding, everything. So every time we make the magazine, we're totally reinventing it. Um, the first artist uh, who acted as guest designer was uh, Helmut Newton. So um, sometime in the winter of 1998, uh, Helmut had come to Francis's winery in the Napa Valley and spent like three weeks there, and they were just making art and um, laying out the magazine. So this is what that looked like. Um, and with our designers, we try to find people who are going to surprise our readers. So we're usually collaborating with artists who've never designed for print before. And um, some of these artists bring uh, humor to the project. Um, like the musician David Byrne, who conceived of a, an issue dedicated to love stories like this. And um, so for David Byrne, that is love. Um, some other artists have a hard time breaking out of prior conceptions of their work, um, like the, the painter Wayne Tebow, who uh, chose uh, kind of just a straight gallery presentation of his work. And so, Tom Waits. Uh, so the musician Tom Waits, uh, Francis had been telling me for ages I needed to get Tom to design an issue of the magazine, and he wouldn't tell me, I didn't know him as a visual artist, he wouldn't tell me exactly what Tom made, except apparently for birthdays and holidays, uh, Tom makes these art pieces that he gives to his friends. And so I started calling him and writing him letters, and he would kind of politely decline. Um, and this went on for years. And then one day I was in my office and the phone rings and uh, there was just that voice on the other end of the line, uh, hi Michael, this is Tom Waits, which is a terrible impersonation. But I mean, it was an arresting moment for me. And so I immediately started blubbering about, oh, I'm, thank you for your call and you know, I'm really excited to collaborate with you. And he said, well, before you get too excited, let me tell you what I'm doing right now. Um, and went on to explain that at the moment his sort of artistic preoccupation was that he was taking photographs of oil stains in parking lots. And he said that um, it, it wasn't, a, my first question was, was that a political act? And he's like, no. Um, it wasn't anything about the environment or waste or anything, it was just he liked the look of them. So he would shoot them on black and white film, um, get them developed just like at his local photo mat on just a simple four by six print, he would write the name of each image, I mean, I'm sorry, the location of each image on the back, and when he was on tour, he would lie in bed at night and look at these images, and he found them very soothing. 
Um, so I was asking him how he ever started on this, and he told, he sort of digressed, he's, he's a man of many digressions, and he digressed into another story about going to a racetrack with a friend, um, so they'd watch the horses run, and afterward they went to the stables, and um, they were walking through the stables, and Tom had seen um, on one barn door, a horse had gnawed a pattern on the door that looked like a horse leaping over a fence, and this um, Tom had his, his camera, and so he took a photograph of it, and that night he was uh, thinking about it, and the image really troubled him. So he went back the next day and, um, to see the horse again, and someone had painted over the barn door, and he said in that moment he understood sort of the beauty and profundity of happenstance and um, transitory images, which had taken him to the oil stains, and he kept telling me that as soon as I saw this photo of the horse, it would blow my mind, and it did. Um, I guess we cropped out the fence that was below that. Um, so this was the image that started his, his oil stain series. And um, it, inevitably, it, it was the cover. Um, and as I, I started talking to him more about sort of how, what sort of design idea or ethic should, should guide the magazine, and he started telling another story about how he loves tractors. And um, so apparently, he lives on a farm north of San Francisco, and he's constantly buying tractors and um, because he wants to take them apart and see how they work, but he hasn't quite mastered how to put them back together. So these tractors, these disemboweled tractors, are abandoned all over his property, and his wife is constantly hassling them, him about them. Um, and so that sort of became this conversation of, uh, well, maybe with his design, he would try to strip away all sort of the finish and polish of normal magazine design and try to show something that felt more DIY and made it home. Um, so this, these are some of the spreads. You can see the, the, image, the, the oil stains. So he hand wrote everything, the page numbers, um, the section breaks. He just kind of put a line. Um, and as we went on, uh, well, as we went on um, he, he would call, and uh, he didn't have email. So he would call and really excited about some new image he'd taken. So, you know, oh, I just took this photograph in Boston or L.A. or Paris or wherever. Um, and I want to replace it with the image on page 46, and then would send it to us in the mail with these very specific instructions, and we would just sort of laugh because, like, they're, they're all oil stains, you know? I mean, um, but the, he, he, in, his love for them, it just sort of imbued them with more meaning for us, and so as we worked with him, I think we also sort of saw the distinctions in them more and um, came to uh, sort of, you know, love, have our own favorites. Uh, so, uh, Vim Vendors. So, in the late 70s, Vim Vendors was in San Francisco and he's preparing a film for Francis's film company. Um, I actually am lucky enough to have Vim's old office now. Um, so, he's preparing a film for Francis's film company, which is a biopic of the American writer ja Dashiell Hammett. And um, Vim was particularly taken with uh, Hammett's book Red Harvest, which was about Hammett's time as a Pinkerton detective in the mining town of Butte, Montana. And so one night, uh, Vim said he'd, he'd gotten this car, this kind of broken down car that wasn't going to make it, and just drove straight to Butte, which is like a multi-day drive. Um, so he arrived there and was just fell in love with the city, and he was saying that the light, um, the light there sort of reminded him and the colors of an Edward Hopper painting. And um, when we were designing the magazine with Vim, uh, he just returned from there again, um, after being away for 30 years. Uh, he was shooting the film Don't Come Knocking with uh, Sam Shepard and Jessica Lang. Um, and so he wanted to do, his magazine, he wanted to be sort of like an homage to his favorite American town, which is Butte. So um, we presented both his, uh, the images from his original trip, which um, were, are black and white and kind of have sort of a snapshot feel. Um, and along with images from his, his shoot there, which were saturated with color and kind of reflected the wide angle of, cin of uh, cinema. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, like that could be a Hopper painting, but it's a photograph. And then uh, P.J. Harvey, the musician P.J. Harvey. So in uh, 2009, um, P.J. Harvey was approaching her 40th birthday, and she gave an interview in which she was asked if she had any regrets about her life. And she mentioned that um, she'd originally intended to be a visual artist, that she'd attended art school um, to study painting and sculpture. And while there, she was playing in bands more and more, and kind of the recording and touring took over. 
And so um, her, her visual art practice, which was very central to her sense of self, had totally evaporated. And she appreciated you know, the life that music had given her, but just regretted that she was no longer a practicing visual artist. So I was searching, I mean, that was very intriguing to me. And that's like, for me, that's how a lot of these issues start, is you just read something about somebody who's making something that, you know, an artist that you didn't anticipate. And so I started searching around for any evidence of her work and couldn't find anything. Um, you know, and then it sort of becomes a leap of faith because who knows how good it is. But uh, I started uh, asking friends and colleagues if anyone knew how to reach her and someone knew her manager who was willing to facilitate an invitation. And so I presented the magazine as an opportunity to recatalyze her art career, that we could provide her sort of the structure and the, and the venue in terms of deadlines and, and a place to show her work. And then she could just make art. Um, so immediate, soon she enthusiastically accepted and then started sending these really beautiful um, drawings and these really tactile, kind of playful sculptures. Um, and the issue came out, and um, pretty quickly she was contacted by galleries in New York and Paris and, and, and uh, London about doing shows of her work, and now she's a practicing artist again. Um, and when she was preparing the art for the issue, she was concurrently recording her record, uh, Let England Shake. And she's spoken pretty extensively in interviews since then about how preparing art for the magazine and recording the record were these really symbiotic uh, pursuits because there, it's kind of each one was sort of unlocking new channels of creativity and it was very much connecting her back to um, this 20-year-old self who was really political. And, um, and then that record uh, obviously went on to win the, uh, the 2011 Mercury Prize. Um, Agnes Varda, the French filmmaker Agnes Varda, she was another person I'd been after for a long, long time. And uh, I'd ask her, and she was, she'd have, she was working on a film, um, she had a photo show, um, doing installations. Um, when, I, when she finally agreed, um, she told me to call her, um, and she was in Marseille, and had been taking overhead shots of the city for some art show. Um, and she's 85 years old and was in a helicopter on a tether leaning out photographing the city. Um, so, and what she wanted to do with the issue, she said, was to sort of make this statement to the world that um, she was no longer a filmmaker um, and she was now a, an artist. Um, so we presented her photographs and she wanted to make a very literal statement. I've been a filmmaker, I'm a visual artist now. And um, that's really what the magazine has offered all of our artists over the years, is an opportunity to reinvent themselves, to um, ex you know, demonstrate these other modes of creative expression that people don't know about. Um, and for us, it's exciting just to work with people who've never worked in print before and just sort of don't have any of the conventions in, in mind or precedence of what works and what doesn't. Um, I love that photograph. Um, so then uh, some of the other artists we've worked with, uh, David Bowie, and that's one of his spreads. Uh, Julian Schnabel. Dennis Hopper. Ed Ruscha, William Eggleston, uh, and sort of to demonstrate the kind of guerrilla nature of how we reach these artists, um, Eggleston, the photographer, he was a guy I'd been after for a long time too, and um, he was, wouldn't even answer my calls or emails or anything. And then I ended up meeting a, well, starting to date a woman um, who had grown up with his daughter and um, they'd been friends all through childhood, and so I happened to mention to him that uh, I was dating this woman now, and, and he had very fond memories of her, which isn't surprising, because she's very charming, and we're married, which is my wife now. Um, <laughs> but he uh, then, which very readily agreed, which I figured was a good endorsement of her, and I was mentioning to her then that, you know, the only thing that I needed to sort of unlock his participation was mentioning you, because he has all these warm memories of you, and she started laughing because she was saying that they were always afraid to go over to his house because he'd like smash pianos and shoot firearms in the house and stuff. Um, and these were a bunch of new photographs that he'd never shown before. Uh, Gus Van Sant, the American filmmaker Gus Van Sant. So when I was talking to Gus about an issue, 
uh, he was saying that he wanted to show these um, screen prints that he'd made in the 70s. And uh, then he started to send work, um, and it looked like this. Um, and apparently when he was going through his archives and looking for these old screen prints, he'd come across an old Apple IIe computer that he'd had like 20 years earlier or something, and he turned it on and somehow it worked. And so as he's looking through his old files, old letters and scripts and stuff, he came upon the clip art gallery, and he wanted to do an issue totally out of 20-year-old Apple IIe clip art. So um, that was sort of an, a number of images overlaid, or graphic effects overlaid, and that was just sort of more straight. Um, Zaha Hadid. Um, so we, you know, we try to get designers sort of from every medium. Um, at the time Zaha was designing the issue, she was also designing the, the Maxi Museum in Rome and the uh, Grand Theater in Rabat and bouncing back to the, um, the, uh, her office in London. And I get these emails just like in the middle of the night from time zones all over the world. Um, Chip Kidd, uh, he, he designed the issue with these really beautiful, these, these are actually just, um, there's, these aren't altered at all. There are these photographs of these kind of dioramas that this artist Thomas Allen makes out of old pulp paperbacks that are really cool. Uh, Elizabeth Payton, the American artist. Mike Mills. Mark Mothersbaugh. And you'll see that you know, the formats will change. We'll do sort of like landscape and portrait. So Mark Mothersbaugh is one of my own heroes from Devo. Um, and actually, the American film director, John Hughes, um, contributed a piece to this issue, which actually happened right before he passed away. Um, and he was talking about how inspired he'd been by Mark Mothersbaugh when he was writing the script for Vacation. I guess he'd been listening to Devo like over and over and over. And so uh, I introduced those guys, and they became friends. Uh, Marjan Satrapi. Lou Reed. So for me, Lou Reed was kind of like an apex personal hero. And um, when he agreed to design an issue, I was really especially thrilled. Um, so we were supposed to have a conversation to start talking about what he wanted to do with the magazine. And at the time, so I was in San Francisco. He was in Barcelona. And um, his manager was in Los Angeles and had set up a conference call and patched us together. Um, and so we, we get on the phone, and the, the connection was really bad. Um, because Lou was in, a, in a, a park in Barcelona speaking on a borrowed cell phone, and the connection kept dropping, and he was getting really frustrated, and as the conversation went on, he started kind of like yelling at me like it was my fault. Um, I started, I was sort of waiting for the manager to step in and give me some coverage explaining that I have no control over cell reception in Barcelona. Um, and the manager remained very quiet. <laughs> and so for that, in that instance, I was thinking like, wow, you know, we need to sort of work together. How's this going to go? And he turned out to be a totally lovely guy. Um, he was saying that the, the sort of idea that he wanted to manifest in the magazine was um, the, he kept saying gothic modern. Um, I still don't know what that oxymoron means. But um, so we had a pretty spare design and we found a a, um, an artist in San Francisco who made these really beautiful wood blocks, which we superimposed over his images. Apparently, this is Gothic modern to Lou. And um, he became a great friend of the magazine and would suggest to other friends of his that they design, um, which we very much appreciated. Um, Guillermo del Toro. So um, on occasion, we'll do a, a, an issue around a theme. Um, this issue was the Latin American issue at the time. Uh, Francis Coppola was shooting a film in uh, Buenos Aires called Tetro, and in preparation for the film, he'd been reading a lot of Latin American writers, and so he and I were kind of talking about how, um, for much of the world, their sense of Latin American writing is sort of arrested in the boom of, um, you know, Mario Vargas Llosa and Marquez and Cortazar, and that there are all these amazing new writers in Latin America now that just on a world stage people don't know about as much. So um, we dedicated this issue to the best kind of emerging Latin American writers, and um, Guillermo uh, designed. Mikhail Baryshnikov, Kara Walker, Thurston Moore. Um, so Thurston Moore from the, um, the musician, uh, this was sort of a collaboration with his wife, uh, Kim Gordon. You know, they were in the band Sonic Youth together. And um, Kim actually painted the cover, 
and their idea was um, for Thurston was going to take photographs and Kim was going to paint on them. And Thurston had written this really lovely essay about how this was sort of this, um, whenever they work together, it's this expression of love and everything. And then unfortunately, they split a couple months after the issue came out. But um, so the, this is one of uh, Thurston's photographs. Then Kim had painted on it. And um, before, so they, they, they assembled these photographs and then had packed them up and had shipped them to me. Um, but they hadn't let any of the paint dry before they'd shipped them. So they come to the office and they're just like a solid stack. And so uh, we spent a long night trying to separate all of them and just carefully peeling away these cover sheets. And you can see like even like the paint, paint just totally just bled and um, you can see some sort of white residue from the cover sheets. Um, so I thought that they were just ruined, but we scanned them and sent them to Thurston and he really loved the effect. So that's what we went with. Uh, Beck, the musician Beck, he seemed to have a bit of a John Baldessari obsession with the, the dots. Um, the Fashion House Road Arte. So um, this was another themed issue uh, dedicated to horror stories. Uh, Kim and uh, uh, Lauren Kate Malevi, who do Road Arte, are uh, big fans of the horror genre and it influences a lot of their collections. So um, they designed this issue. Ryan McGinley, it's Faustina, who's a, a, a graffiti artist in San Francisco. Abbas Kiristami, the filmmaker. Actually, John Baldessari. Michael Stipe from REM. Martin Mull, um, who, uh, th that guy is such a polymath. The actor, I knew him from like Roseanne. And um, these are all these like photorealistic paintings. I mean, they're, they're amazing. And, uh, and then the final slide uh, commemorates the happy news that uh, three weeks ago in New York, uh, the magazine was awarded the 2016 uh, National Magazine Award for Fiction, which is kind of the highest honor due in American periodical. Um, the other two finalists were uh, The New Yorker and Harper's. Uh, and it was our third time we'd won the award and it's gratifying to, uh, to win against such bigger publications because um, we're a staff of two and uh, you know, we have our association with Francis but we run the magazine on our own budget which is probably smaller than uh, those magazines spend on drinks in a year. Um, so thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce the magazine to you. Michael, thank you very much. That's, I mean, like just seeing it presented like that, that just looks like the most ridiculous dream job. The, it, it, it looks amazing, but the, there must be pressures and frustrations. What's, who's the one? Who's the one who you've always wanted and never managed to get in oh, there? Oh, well, uh, there are a few. I mean, there's still so many. Um, David Lynch is someone we've talked to. I mean, he's contributed to the magazine as a writer. Um, Jim Jarmish is another person. It's, the difficult thing is, um, and I should have mentioned too, we, ha we don't have a budget to pay these designers. We just send them like a case of wine from Francis's Vineyard. Um, and they agree to it. The, the thing that's really inspiring about it is these people have these massive careers um, and they recognize still that with a magazine like this and that there's still this very rare opportunity for total creative freedom. So all we tell them is that it has to have a barcode on the cover and the name of the magazine needs to be somewhere, but you can see that people have like reinterpreted, you know, we have sort of a logo, but nobody really uses it. Um, and it, it is kind of, you know, our, our newsstand distributor, it just goes crazy with every issue because it's, no one knows what it's gonna look like issue to issue, but that's very much a part of our mission. Um, and we do have these kind of like very dedicated following that makes the magazine continue to go. Um, but yeah, I think working with a different artist every time, it is a leap because you don't know, you don't know what your working relationship is going to be like. You don't know, um, and you have to really try to manifest that person's vision, even if that person's vision differs from your own. Um, and even if you feel like you kind of know better about what works and what doesn't. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I feel like with every issue, there, I feel like there are mistakes and things. Um, and then it comes out, and it just sort of looks inevitable and, and have, have you ever Have you ever had anything that you just couldn't print? It's like you just can't put that on the front of a mag. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we try not to. You know, I mean, I think like full frontal nudity would be difficult. I mean, we've had some nudity. Um, and yeah, we'd gotten a. Uh, uh, I probably shouldn't tell this. Well, I will. Um, <laughs> there was a, a, a certain wife of a former Beatle. Um, who was going to do an issue that was mostly um, very personal nudity um, that was printed over the stories. Um, and that's something that we always try to protect is that, the, like, that the, the, the designer needs to respect every writer. And the magazine fundamentally needs to be a reading experience. Um, and I think we got to a point where we had kind of different aims and, and that one sort of... Uh, Unraveled, but the invitation's <laughs> always out there if she wants to come back. Okay, I think she's in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. I was so glad we could have you here. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you.